we're monks and we, you know, we, we celebrate the older form of the monastic and Roman rites with Gregorian chant and Latin. All of our offices are chanted in Latin, mass is chanted in Latin. We rise for 3.30 in the morning. Uh, it used to be four o'clock, but there was a, a time uh, uh, a little under a year ago when we had a particular need. Uh, we wanted to ask God for a particular grace. So I said to the other monk uh, who was with me at the time, I said, uh, the only way to do this is, is through sacrifice and prayer. So we moved it to 3.30, and we've been very happy ever since, and God's even blessed us with what we wanted, uh, what we asked, uh, which was great. But, uh, you know, 3.30 in the morning is pretty early, and uh, it's very, very beautiful to take with you uh, as you trudge sometimes, you know, in the cold and so on, uh, but into your choir stall. It's, it's very beautiful to take particular intentions uh, for people and to offer that, that particular office. I, I joke sometimes that, you know, Matins is the greatest office at 3.30 because you catch God's ear before other people get up and, and, and get into his ear as well, so he hears you a little more, more clearly. And monks do that. You know, they, they whisper into God's ear all day. Lord's is a beautiful office. We celebrate at 6.00. It has those wonderful Laudate Psalms, which our Lord himself will have prayed, Psalms 148, 49, 150, which are part of the monastic tradition still. They're, they're unfortunately not in the old Roman breviary. They went out in Pius X, but the monastic office kept them, thankfully. It's a very, very beautiful tradition. So on the office of Prime, which many monasteries and other people don't celebrate, you know, it begins the working day, after which we have chapter and, and the De Profundis to pray for our dead. And, uh, you know, the longer the monastery exists, the more friends and benefactors we have who have died. And uh, they get prayed for at the end of every office, but particularly in chapter prime, uh, where we sing the De Profundis for them. Terse, sext, and known throughout the day, the little hours which punctuate the day with prayer. Conventual mass uh, in the morning. Uh, Vespers, which is a great office because it usually means supper's coming near and the, the working day is finished. Uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely reclining office, thanking God for the blessings of the day, asking God's forgiveness for what's necessary, which is continued in the office of Compline, which is the best office, not simply because at the end of it we turn to Our Lady and sing the Marian Antiphon of the season, which is, which is always very beautiful. We say goodnight to Mother before we go to bed, but it also means that after that, the, you know, one, one is free. <laughs> uh, there is one space to to rest, to, to read, or whatever. But a monastery is engaged first and foremost in the worship of God. It's a house of prayer. Uh, and in any diocese, that's the first role of a monastery, that it be a house of prayer, a place where people can come and plug into that prayer for a few days on retreat, uh, maybe even for longer periods of time, at certain times in their lives, if they need, need that space, uh, that peace, that, that recollection, that renewal. We're a, uh, a diocesan foundation of the Bishop of Régis Toulon in Provence in France. The bishop asks me to work towards the foundation of a monastery, so about eight, nine years ago we started on that and had a bit of a rough start, to be fair, but persevered and have some, some really good young candidates now who are persevering and, and making sure that I get out of bed at half past three every morning, just as they do. And, you know, the, it's, a, it's a small international English-speaking community which is very, very faithful to, to St. Benedict's rule and to the life of prayer and work um, with a special attention to the solemn celebration of the liturgy as well as we can do ourselves and with the help of some friends. Bishop Ray is a, a fairly unique bishop in that he welcomes new initiatives and gives them the possibility to take root and to grow and to flourish. He's very much a father to our community. He visits us frequently, he celebrates uh, pontifical mass for us when there are summer schools and other, other big events. Last, last uh, Maundy Thursday, we had the great honor of the bishop coming and celebrating the Maundy Thursday. Holy Week writes in the very ancient form uh, with us. You know, he has no problem with that. Um, He's very, a very accessible bishop, uh, keeps in touch with us, you know, he, he knows his men in the diocese and the monastery and so on. Uh, he likes to refer to the diocese as a, as a very large garden in which, in which lots of different plants gl grow and flourish. Uh, and uh, we'll be one of those plants, please God. I'm from Australia, from Melbourne, Australia, uh, studying and working in England and was in a monastery in England before 
before the bishop invited me to come to France. And then uh, one, of our, one of our junior monks is from England himself. He has a degree in mathematical, a master's degree in mathematical physics, um, which is beyond my comprehension, but he's, he does well in it. Uh, another is a Chilean, a young man uh, who is in his 20s, late 20s, who studied classics at Princeton and, uh, you know, and is a, an autodidact in terms of Gregorian chant and keeps us, uh, keeps us in line in terms of both our Latin and our chant. Um, both very energetic, intelligent, healthy and happy young men, uh, very dedicated to the monastic life, uh, very zealous. Currently we're living in a rectory in a small village, uh, which is the property of the diocese. The bishop has made it available to us, and we share the parish church next door with the parish, which, get, you know, which works pretty well uh, most of the time. Sometimes there are, you know, there are requiems or funerals or weddings and so on, and we have to sort of change our schedule and things like that. But we're in a, a small tourist village right in the middle of it, and monks need space, they need quiet. Uh, young monks need land to go out and uh, you know, work on and so on. And also, over the years, we've had an increasing number of guests. And in our present arrangement, we have two guest rooms, which is not really sufficient for the number of people who want to come to us to share in our life, particularly at times like Holy Week or Christmas, or indeed in our, in our summer school in the summer, uh, which we've run now, I think, for five or six years. Um, there's pl you know, we need more space. So... We looked at a place, uh, one of the bishop's assistants suggested a place to us uh, a year or so ago, uh, but that didn't prove uh, suitable. There wasn't any land involved and it, would, it wasn't in any sense habitable. We would have had to spend you know, millions on that to, to get it up to scratch and even then we wouldn't have had a garden, etc. But that got us looking at wet our appetite as it were and we found on, on, open, on the open market for sale. The commander of the Knights Templar, that is a pilgrim hostel, the Knights Templar lived a monastic life, so they're monastic buildings with buildings for accommodation of guests, dating from the 11th century, 11th and 12th century, 13th century buildings in the diocese, which is on the open market, uh, a property that was lost to the church at the French Revolution. So the, the chapel uh, became a sort of a mezzanine a dormitory for farm workers. And, you know, the, the liturgy, the Mass, hasn't been offered in that chapel for over 200 years. And we, we like it. It's got about 100 acres worth of land associated with it. It's got buildings which are habitable. The chapel is perfectly usable, so it's the refectory. There's more work to do internally, and there's certainly other buildings that need uh, more, more extensive restoration. But as a place to move to and to develop, uh, we think it's a great opportunity. So we're trying to... We're trying to raise the necessary funds to, to make a purchase on this and to move in and continue the work of its restoration and bring it back to life as a monastic set of buildings. The buildings are in private hands and the gentleman who owns the building, he's never lived there as such. He bought it about 35, 40 years ago. And he has worked as a, as a personal interest, as a hobby. He's passionate about uh, restoring old buildings and he has taken out the mezzanine floors in the chapel, had the apse restored, had the roofing redone, had some of the vaulting repaired, all with the help of the historical monuments people in France, because it's a second-class historical uh, class building, and done a beautiful job. You know, he's done the refectory, as I say, other parts of the buildings have the floors and roofs done. Very wisely, he did the roofs first to, to prevent any further, any further deterioration due to weather. But he's becoming slightly older and wants to hand on the, uh, the, the property to, to custodians who will continue his work of restoration and, and, and you know, sympathetically. Uh, and he's very happy at the prospect of us, but, but, uh, but he's not giving it away for nothing. The chapel is built for the older liturgy. Uh, its vaulting is ready to produce a good acoustic. The apse is oriented, uh, you know, facing east. It's waiting for a beautiful stone altar when we can raise the funds for it, you know, to, 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 to be there. It's, it, these buildings are built for the liturgy. The greatest pastoral work of any monastery is that the divine office is sung day in, day out, morning, noon, night. You know, some people will come to us because it's an historic site. 
and be tourists. And if they encounter the office being sung you know, in Gregorian chant, that will transfix them. That already happens where we are when people stumble across us. It transfixes them. It speaks of God in a very busy and secular world. And then people who, who, who come to stay for longer for a retreat can drink more deeply of those riches. After all, the liturgy is, is the word of God living and acting in the church today. It's, it's not just the, the singing of certain notes and using of certain words. It's, it's Christ himself acting in the church today, speaking to us through the psalms, through the readings, through the gestures and rites.